kids. Just remember, you can never go wrong with Steve Earle. You can never go wrong with Steve Earle. All right, in this presentation, we're going to briefly be running through the rise of the progressive movement, mainly the labor unions and the rise of the muckrakers, the people who were trying to bring about change in this era. We first want to start out with the American Federation of Labor. Now this was a uh, labor union that was pretty broad and all-encompassing. It's going to be a big powerful uh, force in the labor movement for a very long period of American history. It was founded uh, basically to try and improve living and working conditions and wages for uh, people who worked in those you know types of jobs that just they really weren't appreciated and their longtime president Samuel Gompers this guy here now just take a look at Samuel Gompers I've always thought this picture of him was very odd uh, you know he looks like he's very squat and has a very giant head uh, I'm sure it's just the picture because in other ones he doesn't look quite that uh, much like a dwarf I guess but uh you know, I just saw he does have a great sense of style, though. I will say that about him there. Just look at that nice all white look. Uh, got the flag there. Because basically, this guy wanted to represent the American worker, the American laborer. Now, he was from a Jewish immigrant family, lived in New York, and basically, his entire childhood was spent being a, I won't use the word slave because it was his father, but his father made him roll cigars constantly. His father sold cigars and this guy spent his childhood essentially doing this menial little labor for his father. And living in New York, he kind of got to be around the working class people, you know, the people who didn't have a very uh, good life. And remember, we're talking about this Gilded Age where the wealthy just had extraordinary amounts of wealth. And this guy, uh, you know, he saw the other side. So he is going to spend his life and efforts trying to better working conditions, you know, fighting for a 40-hour work week, an 8-hour work day, uh, better pay for workers. And he is going to be a powerful force in the American Labor Union for a very long time and by the time he's done he has like you know over a million workers in 1904 later they're going to join with other labor organizations like the one I'm about to talk about here with John L. Lewis where these two men essentially their organizations are going to get to where they represent over 23 million people now John L. Lewis was the founder of the Congress for Industrial Organization this was a labor union specifically to uh, support the people who worked in the industrial plants, you know, the factories, manufacturing jobs. And he is much more aggressive in the stance of going on strike, whereas Samuel Gompers tried to use government, you know, an intervention and policy change. John L. Lewis was like, we need to go on strike, we need to make them feel the pain. So they're not going to gain a lot of sympathy early on basically because people kind of see them as rabble rousers, trouble causers, and we'll kind of get to that here in a second. Like this incident, Haymarket Square, uh, this was an unfortunate incident in Chicago where workers were going on strike and the police were brought out to kind of squelch the crowd and you know run crowd control and someone throws a bomb into the police lineup. It explodes, kills seven police officers, uh, the officers open fire on the crowd, four protesters are killed, over 70 people are wounded. So the American public kind of sees stuff like this as well these guys are just a bunch of trouble causes, causers. It's going to hurt the labor cause quite a bit. Another one would be the Homestead Strike. This was in 1892. Now in this one the governor of the state of Pennsylvania actually used troops uh, to come in and what they did with the workers went on strikes. So they said, fine, you know, this is the Carnegie Steel Plant. We'll bring in other people who won't want jobs. Now, when this kind of stuff would happen, uh, quite oftentimes the people who were on strike would threaten the crowd, intimidate the crowd, sometimes even attack uh, people who were trying to go into the plant. So they actually brought in 
troops to protect these people who were on strike. Uh, another one would be the Pullman strike. This one was in Chicago again. You'll notice Chicago showing up quite a bit in here. Uh, it's always been a city with a lot going on. So in Chicago, 1894, uh, these people go on strike. Now they worked at a factory where they made railroad cars. And it might seem like, well, you know, if they go on strike, it won't hurt uh, that much if they don't stay on strike for very long. But just remember, this was the main means of public transportation and shipping goods around the country. This was a very busy place. And what had happened was their employer basically cut their pay and uh, they didn't like it. And this was kind of a factory town where you kind of, a lot of the uh, people who lived there and worked there, they were, everything was kind of connected. Some of these places even had like factory money they paid you in and you had to spend it there and they own the place you live so they might raise your rent but not raise your pay stuff like that happened quite often so this was hurting the entire country and a lot of these strikes like this would kind of spread to other places where people around the country sometimes you might have as you know the wall the workers walk off here and around the country over 250,000 people they were yeah inspired by this and they went on strike. So this one actually went around like 27 different states. There were people going on strike saying we support those workers. And a judge actually orders them to return to work. And the situation gets really ugly really fast. I mean, President Cleveland even sends troops in. Uh, these people start clashing with the troops. Over 30 workers die in this. And this was like a riot where they actually tore up large sections of the city, over $80 million in damages, and eventually the leaders of this strike are arrested and the entire thing is shut down. So sometimes situations like that aren't exactly the best for getting the public's attention. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes something like a tragedy, like the Triangle Fire. This happened in a New York shirtwaist factory. Most of the people working in here were women. This was a 10-story building, and there were no fire escapes, you know, only one elevator. And what happened here, unfortunately, someone either threw a cigarette butt or something in a trash can, and the trash can catches on fire. Um, before anyone notices what's going on and can put out the fire, uh, it spreads, and it basically sets off the middle of this building on fire. So you get people who are actually trapped above, like on the ninth and 10th floor, and they cannot get out of there. You know, people, they try to get the fire hose, you know, they run in there, and we're like, oh, this would be like their fire extinguisher, basically. Hose isn't long enough to get where the fire is. So people start panicking, trying to run out of there. Uh, they fill up the elevators to the point that uh, you know, no one else can get on, it's not moving uh, fast. You try to turn and run and go to the uh, stairs, it's blocked by fire. The fire department shows up with their ladders to try and get the people off you know, the top floors. The ladders aren't long enough. And eventually what happens is fire just engulfs the place and you've got all of these women trapped up in the top floors of these buildings. And uh, 123 women are killed, 23 men who worked in the factory as well. You know, a lot of these were like managers and people like that. Uh, and a lot of these people, unfortunately, when your choices are burn alive or jump to your death, a lot of them actually took these death leaps and jumped down to their deaths. Now, this was a travesty. You know, big tragedy, and it caught the nation's attention. You know, people actually saw the pictures of these women laying out on the sidewalk, uh, dead, and it called, you know, it created a national outrage. People were like, we need fire escapes, we need uh, fire alarms, we need uh, safety procedures, you know, people practicing fire drills and things like that. So, all kinds of safety laws kind of came out of this. Better working conditions. Because a lot of times in these places like this, women would be uh, literally locked in their workspace. And you know you couldn't actually get out and leave because they didn't want them loitering or going and hanging out, talking with other people. You know They'd send you to your workplace and actually lock you 
in there. So sometimes it takes a big tragedy, something like this, to really get the nation's attention and bring about change. And speaking of bringing about change, now the muckrakers, they were a group of people. A lot of them were journalists, and a lot of them were using new types of journalism. It's not just the written word. Uh, they're going to use photographs. Uh, basically, the early forms of social media would be like, you would take pictures and you would put them on galleries. Or a uh, guy we'll talk about here in a moment uh, took this photograph here, uh, Jacob Reese. This was a guy that went around and said, "We're going, you know, I'm going to get the word out," because he went through these slums and places like New York City and saw how these people were living. These just uh, people living in these awful, awful conditions. And a lot of these people were working class. You know, it's not like these people were homeless, but you might have 20 guys living together in a one-room uh, shack, you know, in an old abandoned warehouse. And not only did these people want to bring about change as far as the way people lived and uh, you know the conditions they had to work in and stuff like child labor and things like that, they also worked at exposing government corruption. So uh, here it is, Jacob Reese. Now this book is full of photographs, and this one we're about to see here in a second is the most famous one. Uh, he basically took this one at night by going in and he had a new form of flash photography. Uh, basically they would put pow pack powder in this thing and it would create a spark and you could take pictures at night. So he just kind of stepped around a corner where he knew a bunch of these immigrant workers were in there living just in these awful conditions and snapped this photograph. And he went around uh, New York City to all the Lati Da people, he would put on these presentations where the wealthy would come in and he would show them these slides. You know, they were kind of like on glass uh, panels and you would stick them in front of a bright light projector and it would depict the image on screen. And he showed how these people were living and the wealthy were just aghast at the stuff that they saw. So this led to all kinds of tenant reforms in New York City, you know, uh, the tenement houses where these people lived in rules about cleanliness, sanitation, how many people could live in one place. Uh, and sometimes it took something like that to uh, get the public's attention. And I had a tar bell, boy, this uh, lady here, she was really big. I mean, she was a writer. She went after groups like uh, Carnegie, or excuse me, Standard Oil, and basically said, you know, this organization is terrible in the way they treat people and their business practices and what they do try you know with their uh, trust that they build up running over the competition you know the government needs to step in and start regulating these big businesses but sometimes it's not the truth that gets things through sometimes it's a work of fiction now the reason these works of fiction are so powerful is because there's truth in them but you get to the characters in the story and you see how these people live in the conditions they're in and you relate to it much more now this man here up in Sinclair again Chicago he basically went in and got a job for a short period of time in a meat packing plant and he said I am going to what he actually was trying to do was the conditions of the workers. He felt sorry for the workers because he knew what was going on in these places. So he's like, I'm going to write a book. And it's going to make the people so mad that they're going to demand change, that these workers be treated better. Well, he has a famous quote that's something to the effect of, I aimed for America's hearts, but instead I hit them in the stomach. Because what he w did, he went in there and he saw what was going on. He just got all this information. He was like, yeah, I'm going to put this in my book. And he was wanting to help the workers. And in a way, I guess he did. Uh, but that's not what caught the public's attention. In this book, he basically detailed all of the gruesome, nasty, disgusting things that he saw in the meatpacking industry. I mean, stuff where they look like took old butter and mixed it in with the new and then sold it in these big block things uh, to the American public and cities. Uh, you know, he, he mentioned stories of how, you know, the canned meat that they like sent to Union soldiers during the Civil War was like three, four, five years old when he, they sent it to them. Uh, but the most gruesome details was just about the people working in there and how the people cutting the meat 
their hands were all chopped and they'd sit there and they'd cut themselves and they would bleed into the meat and they would have to keep working so human meat was getting mixed in with the uh, beef how they took old beef beef and mixed it in with new beef and sold it as 100 percent completely new uh, talked about the people who actually had to strip the uh, hide off of the animals like the sheep how they would pour acid on these sheep and then rip the wool away by hand and the acid would get in their hands and would start eating away at the human flesh you know, talked about workers literally falling down into these places where they kept the fertilizer because they had all the cattle there and they'd bring them in and store them and try to get them fat by feeding them this junk basically and these cattle they were diseased I mean like nasty diseases some of them you know when they would go to slaughter them uh, this black bile pus would just explode all over the person's face who was slaughtering it because these things had so many diseases and the people working in these factories had diseases I mean like tuberculosis and things like that some places you worked there for five weeks you were like deathly deathly ill and the rats and stuff running around you know getting in with where the meat was processed and rat droppings and stuff everywhere you know people working in the freezers who didn't have shoes and they wrapped newspapers around their feet and you know their feet were just all bloody and nasty and it was just gross and disgusting and when people read it that's what caught their attention so this actually led to the meat inspection act later uh, this also led to the Food and Drug Administration where basically these meat packing plants were unregulated they said we have to do something to regulate the meat industry make sure it's safe the Pure Food and Drug Administration it of course regulates anything humans can consume put into your body basically food you know it's why you have to have the labels on the back of anything you consume be it food or medication and there's always going to be a list this is what's on there an expiration date you know something like that would be nice so you're not getting just this uh, nasty out of date stuff like they were with the meat industry back in this era so I mean vivid details about how people's hands were basically rotting off and some of them had lost fingers and they just had nubs and they could barely hold the blocks of you know infected old meat that they were slicing open so that's kind of the introduction to the muckrakers and the progressive era these are the people that said we need change and they were going to do something to bring about that change